So hello everyone, good day. This is Philip Chester Lundok from BS Edmat 2. And this is Christian Arguelles. Bago natin i-present yung topic, panoorin niyo muna yung dalawang videos. Maganda tong dalawang videos na napili namin. Make sure na panoorin sila kasi it will help in case na magpa-essay si ma'am sa susunod nating exam for history of mathematics. Let's watch. sequence begins with the numbers 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and continues indefinitely. Each number is obtained by adding the last two digits together. If we were to take a perfect or golden rectangle, break it down into smaller squares based on Fibonacci's sequence, and divide each with an arc, the patterns begin to take shape. We begin to see Fibonacci's spiral. The spiral in and of itself is insignificant. Its importance is revealed in where we find it. Take for example the sunflower. The display of its florets are in perfect spirals of 55, 34, and 21. The sequence of Fibonacci. The fruitlets of the pineapple create this same spiral based on the sequence. The pine cone does the same. As currents move through the ocean and the tide rolls onto the shore, the waves that bring in the tide curve into a spiral that can be mathematically diagrammed onto a plot at the points 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and 55. Buds on trees, sand dollars, starfish, petals on flowers, and especially the nautilus shell are formed with this exact same blueprint. With each segment of growth, the Nautilus adds to itself one more value on Fibonacci's scale. This blueprint can be seen around us on a small scale every day, but the greatest example of all is directly above our heads. At an average of 100,000 light years across, even the spiral of the galaxies above us are formed with the exact design that the tiny shell is formed. This sequence, our blueprint, appears to be the trademark of a designer. Ang galing, no? Well, that's Fibonacci in the nature. Now naman, panoorin natin yung isa pang video about naman siguro yung mas application ng Fibonacci. Uh, let's wait. Ito na. I'm sometimes asked, why am I sort of so intrigued with spirals? What is it about spirals? And I, I think... Part of the answer is that I just find them beautiful. But I think spirals also make reference to the fact that you can never return to the same place again, that nothing ever does truly repeat. It goes infinitely small and it goes infinitely large. It's endless. And you know, we sort of don't know where we came from and we don't know where we're going and we're just sort of this, you know, this, this piece of that larger picture. I'm John Edmark, I'm an artist, designer, and inventor, and I teach at Stanford University. I don't think of myself as a sculptor. Clearly, the works are sculptures of sorts, but in a sense, that's a coincidence. They're just the medium that I'm using to ask and answer questions that I'm interested in. The driving motivation of my work is a search for unusual behaviors things that, that are non-intuitive, that maybe seem impossible. Math has a kind of precision and a, a way of clarifying relationships that allows me to, to achieve some of these behaviors and patterns that I'm trying to create. I was working with, with essentially flat puzzles. I noticed that that perimeter never changed shape, it just changed in scale as you added or removed pieces. And that then led to the notion of stacking these one on top of the other and rotating them relative to each other to cause these patterns to appear in the form of sort of plateaus that could move up and down the tower. And I'm rotating it each time, I'm rotating it at 137.5 degrees, the golden angle, which is based on the golden ratio. The golden ratio is the ratio where the smaller is to the larger as the larger is to the whole. And it ends up, this is a very powerful generative ratio Anytime you create a pattern using the golden angle, 
you're going to end up with spirals appearing and it's actually been shown mathematically to be the, the, the best way to distribute leaves on a stem to minimize overlap. I say a leaf or a petal or a, a seed gets put out here, the next one will get put out 137 degrees around over here and the next one then gets put out 107 degrees over here and around and around and around placing these and placing these and when that's done in that fashion you end up getting these kinds of very evenly distributed seed heads. But the spirals are actually a symptom of this process of placing each bud 137 degrees around from the previous bud. When I was wanting to demonstrate this transforming nature of the towers, I, I decided to animate them. And, and when I animated it, I was surprised to discover that not only did it show plateaus appearing and disappearing, but there, there was this very strong sense of continuity of the plateaus moving down the tower or up the tower. About five years later, I suddenly realized, oh, what if I just keep on rotating the entire tower, not just the, not just the next level? And in fact, blooms are a, a direct descendant of a, a multi-year-long sequence of explorations on these golden angle spiral geometry studies. I call them blooms because they tend to have a sense of blossoming, opening, expanding to them as they animate. When a bloom is animating, it's endless. If a plant could grow forever, it would kind of be doing that blooming behavior forever. The first thing I do is I have to create the structure for it, and that is, of course, based on uh, using the golden angle. So I, I place where the elements are going to be, and, and, then, I, and then I shape those elements. Uh, depending on what I want the behavior to be, I, I will then animate them, making them expand, making them rotate. Blooms can be filmed in two ways. You can actually run a strobe that is synchronized to the camera's film rate, or if you set the camera to use a very short shutter speed, it will behave effectively like a strobe. Because the elements of the bloom are essentially frames of animation, if the frames aren't exactly aligned, you're going to get a non-smooth flow. The kind of the distortions and warpings that you see happening are a result of me slightly breaking the rule of rotating by the golden angle. And so they're, they're moving back and forth in terms of, of hovering around that angle, and that causes them to have this kind of, this kind of warp distorted effect. I think my work is most successful when it evokes a sense of wonder, when it sort of seems to be magical. What I'm trying to achieve in my work is something that will evoke that in somebody else, that they'll say, wow, what's going on there? How is that possible? Yun, ang galing, di ba? Pwede niyong panoorin ng panoorin, malamang baka magpa-essay si ma'am about uh, the Fibonacci sequence. Magagamit niyo yun. And now we're back sa lesson proper, mathematics in the medieval ages. Yun, so parang quick background lang, we'll discuss early medieval times, height of medieval times, 14th century, mathematics teaching in medieval ages, and then mathematicians of the medieval ages. We have Leonardo Pisa, and then we'll go to Roger Bacon, Nicole Oresme, Omar Khayyam, and others. That's it. So let's start. The Middle Ages of European History. The period of European history lasted for roughly a millennium. It was commonly dated from the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century to the beginning of the early modern period in the 16th century. It was marked by the division of Western Christianity in the Reformation, the rise of humanism or humanism in the Italian Renaissance in the beginnings of European overseas expansion. Thank you. And then later, makikita nyo kung bakit or kung paano naka-affect yung Christianity sa mathematics or learning mathematics during the Middle Ages. We'll discuss it later. Early Medieval Times or Dark Ages. 
we'll find out. Baka siya tulad ng Dark Ages. Isa-isa yun. Christian churches became very influential. Medieval kingdoms developed in there were warfare. Mathem- mathematics experience difficulties to survive. Under the loss or disappearance of evidences in science and mathematics developments over the centuries. And then last is learning resulting in slowdown in knowledge creation. So, siguro, kung maintindihan na natin kung bakit siya tinawag ng Dark Ages, unang-una pa lang, um, sa first uh, bullet, you'll see, it says, there were warfares. Bakit nagka warfares? Kasi nga, nagsusumpito na yung mga kingdoms during that time. And then, in contrast pa dun, is yung pagiging napaka-influential ng Christianity or Christian churches. And then, nag-result yun sa naghirap yung mathematics. Bakit? Kasi nga, nawala yung mga evidences o mga books or whatever na they can use for learning mathematics or knowledges, other knowledges. Kaya dahil dun, medyo gumaga, gumaga yung, yung process or yung, yung learning or knowledge creation na during that time. Kaya siya tinawag ng Dark Ages. Height of Medieval Times Finally, after Dark Ages. Um, began by the middle of the 11th century and stretched up to the 13th century. Increased activities in agriculture, trade and commerce, towns and middle class developed, universities were founded and learning was revived. Arts and literature flourished, reflecting people's religious beliefs. So, in heights of medieval times, So, dito na po naganap yung pagtas or pagpabalik ng mga knowledge and um, learnings about dun sa mga nawala dun po sa Dark Ages. Then, dito na po yung mas madaming activities about dun sa agriculture and more on universities na na-founded. Tapos, yung arts and literatures, dito nga po yung kat- kagaya po nung sinabi ni Sir Yuchan kanina na na-flourish. So, yung arts and literature po is more on um, reflecting or sumasagisag dun sa religious beliefs ng mga tao na nandito po sa medieval times po. Next is 14th century. The medieval civilization experienced great upheavals, church authority declined. So, in these times, yung authorization or Um, karapatan is nalipat na dun sa mga mamamayan kaysa dun sa church authority na nangyari noon dun sa unang um, sa dark times. Tapos there was famine and disease in Europe and constant war between France and England. So dito na na-experience yung more, ano, more disease tsaka yung or sakit dun sa mga dun sa Europe at merong war na nangyari between France and England. So, hello once again. This is Philip. And we are discussing now the mathematics teachings in the medieval age. So, many of the evidences of the knowledge learned from the ancient world were destroyed due to, war, due to the wars among the kingdoms, barbarians, and conflicts arising from religion. So in here, um, yung evidence or yung um, sabihin na natin yung hooks na naglalaman ng knowledge na kailangang ituro ay nasira kasi gawa ng mga digmaan na naganap among dun sa kingdoms and yung conflicts about religion. Then next is the Byzantium and the Catholic Church became the safe havens for the ancient world. So, sila yung naging um, parang safe house or yung parang nag, nagsilbing bahay kaligtasan dun sa mga mamamayan nung bawat bansa. So, there were few advances and, ma- and much of what had been forgotten from the ancient world was rediscovered and re-evaluated. The Catholic Church introduced education and likewise effectively caused the rediscovery of the wisdom of the past. So, ibig sabihin po ng dalawang um, bullet is yung na-rediscover na po yung 
wisdom or yung knowledge during the past na nasira po dahil sa war or dun sa digmaan na naganap. At nakatulong po yung Catholic Church para mas um, ma-introduce or mabigyan ng daan yung education para, makapag- para makapag-rediscover ng mga wisdom. So, dun sa pagbabalik po ng mga universities or yung way of education, nakatulong po yung Catholic Church and yung others, um, other university na tinayo po ng kan- kanya-kanyang kingdom para po ma-regain yung um, wisdom or knowledge na nawala noon during the war and yun po. <laughs> Salamat. So, we're done with the background or yung mga settings ng no, era or yung period ng medieval ages. Now we'll discuss the mathematicians of the medieval ages, including Leonardo of Pisa, Roger Bacon, Nicole Oresme, Omar Kiam, saka yung mga others or other mathematicians na na-research namin outside dun sa book or textbook na pinagkuha na namin na galing kay Ma'am. Thank you. So, first mathematician is Leonardo Fibonacci from 1175 to 1250. Known by the nickname Fibonacci, because of the um, he wa, he invented Fibonacci sequence then sometimes sometimes use the name Bigolio so according to my research and you can search din naman po yung about dun sa Bigolio niya is para siyang ano binigyan siya ng salary decree nung kanilang um, empire or yung kanilang kaharian doon sa tulong niya sa pagbibigay ng knowledge or wisdom about uh, sa mga mamamayan at sa iba pa po ano, mga tao na nangangailangan. So, in the picture or the slides that you may see, this is the example or yung kung paano makuha yung Fibonacci sequence. Then, ito po ay pinag-aaralan noong grade 10 po. So, he also wrote Liber Abasi, a free rendition of Greek and Arabic works in Latin which taught the Hindu methods of calculation with integers and fractions, square roots, and cube roots. So, dito po sa Liber Abasi is yung pakikita yung mga methods or Hindu methods na para makalkula yung isang integers and fractions and others a mathematical equation po. So, he also wrote a book which contained a numerical treatment of irrational numbers which Euclid had approached from a geometric point of view. So, in this book naman po, it is more on um, irrational numbers na ginawa niya or kung paano ma-handle yung irrational numbers or kung paano ma-solve na dati na pong ginawa ni Euclid doon sa nakaraang ano po, nakaraang video presentation nila. He also introduced the Hindu Arabic place value decimal system and the use of Arabic numbers into Europe. He also wrote a book about the use of Arab Arab numerals which became known as algorithm. Another contained a large collection of problems aimed at merchants. So in this book, yung last three um, last three bullets is more on a discovery or um, pagbabalik ng mga knowledge na nawala noon dun sa kanilang lugar para po ma um, mapag-aralan ulit. So next mathematician we have is Roger Bacon from 1214. 1294. He was known for his application of geometry, geometry to optics. He also carried out some systematic observations with lenses and mirrors. He was aiming to show the Pope that science had a rightful role in the university curriculum and were important to the church. Proposed an, propose for an encyclopedia of all the sciences work on by the te- by by a team of collaborators coordinated by a body of, by, by a body in the church so si Roger is more on science 
kasi ginamit niya yung geometry sa optics. Then, dun sa observation about dun sa lenses and mirrors. Then, gusto niyang mapasama yung science or yung pinag-aaralan niya dun sa curriculum na meron yung Pope or yung mga simbahan or yung churches. Then, yung pinaka-importante part or yung contribution niya is yung encyclopedia about dun sa works about sciences. So, after Roger, next is Nicole Oresme, 1323-1382. He intended a type of coordinate geometry before Descartes or Descartes, finding the logical equivalence between tabulating values, graphing them. So, in here po, it is more on um, coordinate geometry yung ginawa niya bago pa matuklasan yung Descartes or yung Descartes yung about dun sa finding the logical equivalence po. So, one of his works contains the first use of fractional ex exponent although not in modern notation. So, ito yung fractional exponent na nagagamit natin dun sa trigo yung Kaiser Suite. So, next is Omar Kayam or Kayam about 1008 to 1123. His contribution is famous during his lifetime as a mathematician and astronomer who calculated how to correct the Persian calendar. So, siya yung famous pagdating din sa mathematician and astronomer sa kanyang lifetime. Then, yung, siya yung nag-create kung paano itama yung Persian calendar. And then, yung Persian calendar is also called as Jalali cal cal calendar. So, still for Omar Kayam, he's also known for, or also well known for inventing the method of solving cubic equations by intersecting a parabola with a circle. Well, maganda yun. And then, you can research kung paano siya mismo gamitin. But we have a picture. Ayan, yung equation kung paano siya gawin. Now with the other mathematicians, we have Robert of Chester. He translated Al-Khwarizmi's important book of algebra into Latin in the 12th century. And the complete text of Euclid's Elements was translated in various versions by Adelard of Bath, Hermann of Carinthia, and Gerard of Cremona. So, yung copy na contribution niya is yung reviving of knowledge or translating yung mga discoveries sa mga ibang civilization or country para sa civilization or country nila. Next, we have Regiumontatus. He's a German scholar. Um, he was perhaps the most capable mathematician of the 15th century. His main contribution to mathematics being in the area of trigonometry. And in, in po yung picture niya. Siya po, si, siya po yung German scholar. Last of the other mathematicians is Nicholas of Cusa, or Nicolaus Cusanus, 15th century German philosopher, mathematician, and astronomer whose present ideas on the infinite and the infinitesimal or infinitesimal directly influenced later mathematicians like Gottfried Leibniz and George Cantor. He also held some distinctly non standard intuitive ideas about the universe and the Earth's position in it. And about the elliptical orbits of the planets in relative motion, which foreshadowed the latter or later discoveries of Copernicus in Kepler. So it means sa lahat ng mga other mathematicians na tinakal natin, siya yung isa sa pinakamarami or broad yung contribution during the medieval times. So this is the history of mathematics in medieval ages and the mathematicians included. So, thank you very much for watching. I'm Philip Chester Luntok. Salamat po. I'm Christian Arguelles. We're from Lesson 2 Mathematics. Sana nag-gets nyo kung paano naka-apekto sa mathematics yung culture at saka yung situation ng, ng Europe sa medieval time.